Um, mm -hmm. I am proud to is Jake Keel. He's the environmental director of the Kutakana Ecological Foundation. He is also an expert in sustainable business and he is a pioneer of no waste business in New York. Right now he is working on a powerful documentary about deforestation along with Haiti, the Jamaican and Cuban border, and the various social, economic, and environmental problems it causes. But I'll let him get into more detail about that. Help me welcome Jake Keel. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jake. Um, thanks for coming out and seeing what we're up to here. Um, what I'm presenting today is sort of a hobby, I guess you might call it, uh, something I've been working on now for right around see, over 10 years. Um, and basically, my day job, I work for a tourism development company, Kutakana, for some Jamaica Valley, Valley Road, the area. Um, we uh, resort development company, we have hotels, and we run the airport. But this project is something that I'm pretty passionate about. It's something I've been working on uh, since I was doing my master's research at Cornell in 2002. Um, and so what I'm going to present to you is sort of my story and how I came into this issue and why it was interesting to me. And then from there, um, what we've been doing since then with the development of the documentary film. And then at the very end, I'll present a little bit of some of the material we just recently shot on the border in Haiti. Um, we have a 18-minute promo that we put together, um, but there is some graphic material in it, um, so you know, if somebody was interested in seeing it, I'm glad to send a link, password, and whatnot. Um, and for now, we'll present a very short video that we're using to try to compete um, in the competition. Do you want to put on the Zoom? Um, so this is in 2002, um, the Sierra of Calupo National Forest. Starting off, this is an image from the Sierra Valle National Forest. This is in the southern part of the Dominican Republic, right on the border of Haiti. Uh, the Dominican Republic shares the island of Hispaniola with Haiti. Um, and this area is incredibly rich with biodiversity. It's incredibly rich forest habitat. Um, the area at one point was completely separated from the Dominican Republic in historic times. Um, and so it has had a really unique development of its uh, flora and fauna. And the highest endemism in the island, meaning that these are things that only occur when the Dominican Republic has been occur in that area. And then this flower is only considered on the Dominican Republic somewhere else. Um, and so there's this incredible richness, incredible diversity. And I'm showing you the photos of the first times that I went up to Sierra Valupo. This is on the right hand side um, of the area of the Choco. And it just blew me away. It's this beautiful cloud forest, an amazing, amazing pine forest. Um, and there's a scattering of trees up there. This is another endemic species that only occurs in that area. Um, so you have these islands that have a unique evolution of their species, and then you have an area like Sierra de Valupo that's used for more than that. Um, so these incredible riches of species. And so I became interested in this and decided to do my master's work up in this area, um, and looking at the forest as a potential resource for those communities without destroying the forest, but looking at ways we could do uh, sustainable extraction of different products. What I looked at in my master's work was medicinal plants that people are going to use and whether they can be sustainably uh, used for commercial products. It can be brought to San Domingo, the regular medicinal plant markets, and then commercialized um, in that way. And so we started working up in this area, we're looking at plants, we're interviewing people, we're seeing how people use plants, um, and doing a lot of development, doing a lot of ethno botanical work. Ethno botanical work is basically going and talking to people and finding out. This plant, how you use it. There's a really rich tradition of this in the Dominican Republic. But what we started to see also is that there was enormous potential in somewhere like the Sierra Valle, not just for medicinal plants, but also for other activities like tourism, um, where 
meetings and people coming up and spending the weekend in Hawaii and so people coming to other places. It's incredible for us habitat. We have wonderful trail, we have really unique bird species that live up there. There's a few mammals that are only in that area. And we have this incredible monopoly that's called Spanish. So the, the idea was how can we create value for this forest so that it's well protected? So this is in 2002 on the grad student. At that point, you know, you still have your, your idea that's what you're in the cloud. You're in the cloud, you have to create this, this thing more. And in the meantime, you start to see as I'm going up and down the mountain roads in this little part of the field, a pretty alarming trend. And this alarming trend is that this forest is disappearing. As we're going up into the mountains, it's from the coast of the ocean side. It's about a 45 minute, really rough truck drive up into Petro, just to give you an example. And yet, as you're driving up there, you start to see small patches of areas that have been eaten away. By agriculture and basically by truck construction. And so this started to become an issue that was kind of lodged in my head. And something that I started talking to local people on the flow side, where the rivers just end up on the coast. And I was talking to a friend of mine there, and I will never forget this conversation because it stuck with me. In 2001, I said that there was really very beautiful and Paulico River called um, this is the main resource for the community. They said, no, this used to be. What happened? Why is this no longer forest? It's up in the mountains. We started the forest. So that's what I started looking at. This was a number of years ago. I started looking at how forests like this being transformed into other habitat. And what are the reasons for that? Why is it happening? What's driving this? This is a forest. This is the idea that you can start to see these patches being eaten away by the beautiful original forest. So that was kind of how I got into this project. Um, in, in, in about 2010, I teamed up with a partner, a friend of mine from college, who's a director of the in uh, And he makes films basically about social issues. If any of you have ever seen this image, this is the border of DR and Haiti. And sort of this famous satellite image where one side is completely cleared and the other side is very forested. Uh, and it's this very stark difference. And so this has been used in Al Gore's movie about climate change. Use the textbooks and they use it a lot of places. But a different natural resource management has had a huge impact on the trajectory of those two countries, in this case, Haiti and the Republic. And what we're starting to see, and I'll show an image later on that's really uh, alarming and interesting, is that that line doesn't look like that. It's a beautiful satellite image. The original color is not so dark and green. It's starting to eat into a bunch of that, which is the photo I showed um, of Kiko and I, or I'm sorry, Kucho and I, which is a smallholder up in that area. Uh, and you start to see patches disappear, and this is a lot of what we're seeing here. The beautiful mountains um, are still somewhat green, but yet the fungus notes difference. And so as the trees start to disappear, you start to lose the birds, you start to lose lizards, you start to lose uh, habitat, the soil erodes, that soil could then end up in the river, and the river could then end up in the ocean. A lot of the sedimentation is affecting green resources. And so this issue of deforestation is incredibly, incredibly important, not just for the Dominican Republic of Haiti. This is a global issue. People talk about climate change, and you guys have probably heard a little about what that is. Um, a lot of people talk about you know, smog and cars and uh, industrial production. But agriculture and deforestation are also major players in climate change. And so when you have areas that are forested that are being cleared, uh, you're losing a lot of that carbon soup. Embedded and it's protecting um, the atmosphere, and you're doing a lot of that, as well as all these other services that the forest provides. And so these are all images from the Civil War that have been taken over the last uh, 10 years or so. Um, and you start to see how, uh, as forests become cleared, you start to lose some of their soil. I uh, had a lot of times you have cattle um, moved in, uh, they start feeding their new country with one product, and then it becomes really difficult for these forests. Make any kind of and so this is a process that's happening around the world in a lot of different places in a lot of different ways. And so we were looking at East Angola, the island, the situation between Haiti and the Dominican Republic for a really unique case study. So this unique case study is in the top of the plane now, and right now, it's for our eyes in real time. And so it's something that we thought we could make a really interesting documentary profile. We can look at how we 
history of the culture to his work in managing resources and the ways that he sees it in power. And so something that's been really interesting is the fall of um, one of the major causes of evil, which is this right one order that they can be on this side and they're not considered a color and be able to follow this. And these you can see there's actually fires happening in the forest uh, in the area. So why would anyone set this forest on fire? Some parts of the park you have um, agriculture that you just cut down the trees, you clear that land, and then you start planting some crop. And a lot of times these people are in pretty desperate situations. Then there's something else that's really interesting that's happening. It's the production of charcoal. And this is when these two countries start having different interests. Um, the production of charcoal in the Greek Republic of the 80s is primarily a fuel source. In the 80s, uh, the estimates are well over 60% of the country were cooking fuels. The way the charcoal was made is trees are cut down and they're stacked up into these piles that we see in here. Um, they're covered up with some type of material or other, and then usually for dirt. Um, there's some coal underneath that is a bit on fire, and then that wood material underneath cooks a number of days and has some of the big trees that are on As that wood then cooks, um, after a week or two weeks, and it's a very labor intensive process, they pull out charcoal. And that becomes a commodity. In the Dominican Republic, it's illegal to produce charcoal. It's illegal to use charcoal as the food in public forests. Uh, they had a very strong policy in the 60s where they eliminated the water regulator, even for use in countries that eliminated the consumption of charcoal in the Dominican Republic. Uh, and they did this by putting the national parks under the army. They did this by supplying natural gas with subsidized. Stole to all around the country, um, they made tuna production illegal. And so the Dominican Republic really just gets sick. You start to see increases in forest. In Haiti, conversely, at about the same time, uh, almost the same amount of forest, or a little bit more, but at the same time, there was almost no efforts made to protect the forest. Forest cover has gone down in Haiti. But today, according to official statistics, and this is sometimes a little controversial, but the Dominican Republic claims to have about 10 centimeters. Color, which is pretty significant for an island. In Haiti, we have less than one percent. So this has profound impacts on the two countries. In Haiti, you have people that are willing to take very risky uh, work trying to make charcoal and trying to make this illegal commodity in some way to sell. Um, in the Dominican Republic, there's now been a very, uh, I would say, very active illegal trade of charcoal that happens uh, on the Dominican side and there's close to those communications. So this is something we've been following now. Um, the charcoal production specifically um, for almost three years. And what we've seen is who's producing it, how they're producing it, where it goes, how it's transported, how it moves across the border, um, and where it ends up in Haiti on the lines. Um, and there's some suspicion that it's actually going to be exported and controlled by the environment. So why is this so damaging? The one is that it requires a new salt source. It requires an incredible amount of to create charcoal. You need a lot of wood and you need to clear a big area to make relatively small amounts of charcoal. The biggest ovens we've seen were huge cleared areas. Um, this is a pretty big uh, charcoal oven. And this would get to about 30 sacks of charcoal. And so that area that you need to clear to then create 30 sacks of charcoal is very difficult. And so once you clear that forest, it becomes hard for that to regenerate. You start to have soil loss versus rising the species that are in that area. Um, and that product is very, it produces a very inefficient product. There's other kinds of charcoal with other types of wood that are made in other places and in other countries that's entirely more efficient, much more efficient, and just done in a more relatively simpler way. And you have people that are um, trying to scratch out a living on the existing forest that doesn't belong to them, and they're sneaking in and out of the forest, and there's a good chance that uh, a park ranger is coming after them or someone is chasing them. Um, and it's very clandestine. Activity, the efficiency goes way down. People are not willing to spend as much time doing what they're doing and have perfect weather and not really do what they like to do. They're basically trying to plant things and plant as fast as they can. So you start to see how this process happens. This is directly across the border from Sierra Park on the Haitian side, where a lot of the charcoal is then transported and then it moves from the Haitian side. These are actually Dominican producers of charcoal. And a lot of this moves across the border at different points. This one is moved in trucks. This one is moved on paper bags. These 
15 uh, years, we even see charcoal crossing uh, Lake Oswego with the babies and boats. We cross it here with uh, the trucks and then they have boats and then uh, eventually trucks and disappear to the Americans. So we start to see the desperate conditions people would have to be in to do really work that is just really, really physically uh, demanding work. They have to be this is not where the Indians talk to the Indians in preparation. If there was any other opportunity, they would talk to them. Charcoal production this is not where they talk Cut down trees, to stack up those trees, to build these ovens, to then transport the ovens, to move this commodity and all the risks that you take that someone might find in the ovens, parts of the cargo that you have to haul away from the ovens, destroy it. Um, it's pretty, pretty high risk. Very low reward. The producer of charcoal is not going to be happy. And most of these stacks at the site are more than 50 feet high. Basically. And some of these producers are going to take one or two or three or maybe 10 stacks of charcoal and they would be happy. So you're not having to do that. This is also called Port au Prince. And in Port au Prince, the demand is so intense that the labor workers that are there, some other areas in and around Haiti, uh, are doing the kind of building charcoal. So you have this really big issue of what's happening now, what is being done about charcoal production and forestation in the area. It's very little. And that was the interest that we had, and that's why we got involved in the project, is we thought by following this trade and by becoming very aware of what's happening on the very business level, and then trying to create a new deal around it, a new deal that draws some attention to it, and could draw uh, some policy change both on the Haitian side and the Dominican side, and could get people interested in concerned about this issue. So a really big issue that we've been facing with the program and then what's happening. Um, and we think also that this is a really unique case study that can be studied in other places. Uh, there's a pretty famous book called Collapse by a guy named Gary Diamond. Um, if you haven't, you can check it out. It probably uh, would be very interesting to see the case study he does on the Dominican Republic of Haiti. And basically the Haiti's hypothesis is that over time civilizations have collapsed because of the need for mining civilization and so on. And when he looks at what are the natural resources that they should be mining as civilizations have collapsed, and he uses an example of this kind of thing, Haiti and Dominican Republic. And we have a really interesting study about how exactly in those two countries have been building each other and what's happening to their natural resources. And so that's sort of the premise of our uh, film that we can look at this case study and we can refine it. There are other parts of the world, in Central America and in Asia, that there are similar conditions where different countries are using different cultural practices and different natural resources, and that they're going to use them. And we draw uh, markets in Port au Prince to be exploring because of that. Um, and this map that Lucy Holm character in our film is apparently is fairly dependent on charcoal. She sells charcoal in the market for her charcoal to a specific company in the Republic of Saint Barthélemy, and her father makes charcoal in in Barbara, outside of Barbara. This is a market right on the border, just as we come across the border of the Haiti and Southern Dominican Republic where there's a border crossing. And over the more that border crossing, that's where they take the charcoal across the lake and the boats. So you can kind of see the desperation that we have. So our film starts in 2012 when there's a murder in the National Park in Sierra Leone in Sierra Leone. And there's a park ranger who goes up through the park kind of the upper end of the Haitian charcoal producer. And he goes to apprehend him because of some of the conditions that he's gone on. Uh, he park rangers to try to find charcoal that's in his land and which has been removed. And you can see really the precarious situation of how park rangers are going to tackle these sort of conditions. Um, and so he goes, uh, his name is Melania, he goes up into the forest to apprehend the Haitian charcoal producer. And he survives it. There's a confrontation, something happens, and he fires uh, a weapon. Asian charcoal producer. The weapon has rubber bullets, so it doesn't actually harm him, but it's fired at him. And so the Haitian uh, producer and his children attack uh, the park ranger and kill him. And they throw his machetes and then he loses his life. And so this was sort of a scandal that outraged his community, and they lies for why he killed him and what was the deal. And so we started looking into it trying to figure out how could it possibly be that way? Why would someone kill somebody else? Why would this happen? Started looking at all of these other things. And the thing that's been really fascinating about it is that 
Nothing is ever really as it seems when you start to have a philosophy is very clear, no linear theory exists. The relevant to the most part, no linear theory is not relevant. The station was a producer, and we found out that it was through one of the comments that this guy, the rich brother, believed it had a family, and the farmer wasn't necessarily a good guy. So we moved the car to the rear of the street, and we were pretty blocked. So it starts to complicate the issues a little bit. I think more telling about that is what does that tell you about this situation? We're talking about the conditions that they're in the lives of those people still. So, what are some of the consequences of this? Well, this is right on the border of the Southern border. This is literally the northern side of the border from El Paso to the Rich Brother. This is the border which is not that easy. So, I mentioned before you have soil. Um, this is a shot from Haiti that we took. Um, we were in the Bel Air. Previously productive data areas of Haiti are now converted to areas of soil that is no longer productive. These are areas that are literally in less than a mile away from the Amazon Trail of Forest, which is how the El Paso has been inside of the And you can see that other side of the world is This is, you know, I want to be very clear and very careful that our film is not about implicating Haiti as we might set the wrong or in any other case. These are just very specific cases in which uh, land and natural resources have a lot of impact on the country. On the education side, the, the resources of the English just have a bigger population of the people who are using desperation for high school and high school to try to keep up on the urban area of the city. These are rivers that really flow in the Haiti, particularly in the Bay City, on the border of the Haiti Divide. And this is when the drains get heavy rainfalls on the Haitian side. Water that runs through the river side is kind of a permeated uh, lake in the river, and that's a disaster for everyone from the Haiti. There was a major event where there was all that water from this kind of river that flowed down from the river side to the Indian Forest, and the forest is water, and it exploded in this community, and it didn't cause all kinds of damage. This is another natural occurrence that happened in real time. This is Lake uh, Okukuba. Watershed. And literally, this lake is rising right up the street. And in the last 10 years, it hasn't took up this building of the water. And the people of the lake on the northern side of the Kukuba uh, and the Haitian side of the lake are still both these lakes dry. They're starting to lose land on the northern side. This is huge right now. You have a lot of people that are really impacted by this. The suspicion by a lot of scientists is that what's causing the lake to rise is Factors that are much bigger than climate change because there are a lot of changes in the geology and more rainfall than we have here in the Alpha Forest cover means that more water is going to the lake. So this is happening, this is just a little time to help us know that these are things that are happening right now. These are environmental changes that we're talking about, and our children and children are going to be affected by climate change. These are things that we're watching and we're going to be able to get to the So this is why you have to be a wizard for the last 10 years. This is another big problem we see about Wicklow and forest fires. Just a couple weeks ago, there was a major forest fire in the southern part of the park. And so these are uh, issues that happen when you're cutting down forests and putting in firewood. There's a sharp wind that creates these bigger threats that happen. And then the other thing that we've been most profoundly impacted by uh, is the necessity that exists for all the people that can see the nature that can drive the fires. These are kids that are maybe six or eight years old. That up in high water mountains, they're sitting up in their cell phones, and they see these kids walk by the bridge and they think they're going to get hurt. So it's really you know, pretty profound when you start to see these real scenarios of what is happening in the field. It becomes a little annoying to see the things that are killing for us in terms of the opportunity to have some kind of positive impact on the ground and to drive some kind of positive change in the next step. So these are some of the more important things that I've gotten. Could have been listed by garbage in the next step. Um, if you get a chance, there's a there's a website called Global Forest Watch. This is an image of the area which they study, and the bottom it has a timeline where they track forest loss or forest gain uh, over time. So what you saw there was forest loss over time. And this was literally in the ten years that I've been doing this, they have lost 
hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of eight hectares of woods. This is our crew here that we're working on the sustainable infrastructure. I think a lot of you when they uh, arrive at the health office and this is one of the as well. And this is what we're going to do as well. This is my co director, Ron Padilla. I will then be the director of also producers because um, this is our sound guy. And then along the way, we will also be met with um, documentary characters in our story. And the idea with a documentary is that you, what you really don't want to do is you're going to confront a bunch of white folks who can be seen as artists there. They can be seen as being white. What you don't want to make is a super boring film you know, in an area where the racial violence will tell you what's happening. You want to make a story and make it somewhat interesting and exciting. Something that you can kind of discover on your own and learn about the voices and issues and the things that you have. Um, that's the poster of our film. Um, it's called Death by a Thousand Cuts. It's a very good story. The saying that comes on the heels, you know, you also hear that the title is tortured, but also it refers to slow change. Okay, and this imperceptible change that uh, has profoundly So the idea in our case is Death by a Thousand Cuts. Doors are slowly disappearing, it's almost imperceptible until you get to a critical mass, and all of a sudden the doors are slowly opening and then the survivors look at the thing and then the story is coming to an end. And so it's this idea of death by a thousand cuts. It's small little pieces of damage that are causing a lot of pain. So the, the, we have a 15 minute promo, as I mentioned, um, that has a little bit of graphic material in it um, that you heard, um, so we asked them not to show that. So, I'm going to show you some footage from our last Thank you. 
Certainly, there's some areas that it's more marked than others. But what's really drawn my attention is the back sort of behind the line that you see where one side is going to be there and the other side is there. So it's sort of changing. And it's starting to move farther and farther east into the country. So that's one of the things that we've been really surprised by. But we always kind of thought there was this division right there. But there's some areas where it looks like that that deforestation happens, you start to see that. Uh, you said that there is one percent of forest. Do you know what you know, the original percent of forest in the sixties? I believe it was in the sixties. It was somewhere around the early eighties. The, the dominant forest cover in House of Lions is the communicating nature of the environment. Yeah, the, in the, the area we are is the Sierra Leone National Park, uh, right on the border. Not all of the border of the Dominican Republic is National Park, but we thought that was a really interesting area, one because I know the area really well, and it's one of the best of work. But also, it's just a really unique example that we have one area that's not protected and one area that is protected. You look at Google Maps, turn on the protected area, you can see that the border of the Sierra Leone is on one, one side of the coast. Interesting example of how, how protection happens in one space. Some Americans don't feel anything. 
Uh, you know, there, there's a lot of things that happen to me historically that are really interesting. I would encourage you to, to check out Jared Diamond's book, the chapter on the Jews and the Ark and the Lions here. Part of the issue that happened with Haiti was after the, the, the Haitians got their independence, um, they kicked the French out and they basically disbanded these large plantation systems that they had before. And there was sort of rebellion against the French. So the country was very much broken up into small parts. And so, you, you know, the, the good side in some ways, the first they had some, some plantation thinking, some larger scale tracts, and some more of these cores. It's divided up into a bunch of more smaller pieces that are still divided up. Um, I think Russia and Haiti is having a lot of things to do with the politics and things that have happened there over time. But the course has a very deep component. But a striking example of Italy in the 60s, the Great Republic was one of very rigid, very strong policies. You've got the course, you have the gas move over there, uh, the army that you can go to the Asian counterparts, and you start to see course better. Sorry? Yeah, that's funny. I came up in, even before I was doing my master's research, um, I did community service projects in the community of the college town on the border of the coast side near Ottawa. And so for two summers out there, I just really liked the area. And again, when I had this conversation about how the rivers were shrinking, I realized that they were just really amazing. I hadn't explored much of the mountain, but all this growing community is very important in terms of the agriculture, the water, and all the resources that are there. And so the Dumbo is a superior place for that than it is for the mountains. So I started to explore more and more there. It's a really interesting example of the mountain that I have. Yeah, this is like my favorite question too, is what we want in the film is for people like you and for young people and other groups to really start thinking about this stuff. And a lot of social change is very positive. Um, what we've seen in a, in, a, in a big way is the biggest issue that has to be for the big country level solutions that are happening. So these are not issues that are just decided by the people who work on this stuff. It's really impacting the people. Um, these are big sort of country wide issues. One of the biggest issues in Haiti, again, is that the people depend on charcoal as a fuel source, and then there's not infrastructure to have the gas. So here, even in the most remote countryside, you can make your tank with propane or your cooking fuel, and you can go to this power station, fill it up, and go back to the grid. In Haiti, that's not the case. There are train stations, there are some trucks, the roads aren't clear, there are some ports. Um, the statistics that we've heard is that in a full year, Haiti consumes the same amount of natural gas as and still, until that changes, there's going to be tremendous pressure on the energy system. And then there's other solutions that there has to be collaboration between the country. I think the Dominican Republic could do a better job of enforcement of international parks. Right now, if again, we saw some of the activity there on the roof of the national park that was really out of the crowd, it looks like it's not very well done. Um, it does not, again, it's not the fuel goal to the national park there. It's a huge, huge area. And it looks like it's been poorly drawn. There's not enough resources of protection, there's not enough natural gas being consumed, there's other people that are doing things, um, you know, alternatives for the fuel sources that are not responsible. Um, if you look at the population of Haiti, it's close to double the population of the Dominican Republic, a third, one third of the island. Um, there's tremendous pressure on those systems. These are big problems, big, uh, big issues that need to be addressed. I think the, the point of our film is to get this out. Yeah, well, I think to, that's, you know, there, there's been a couple small efforts like that um, in, in the previous missions of the matter here. 
to do the project, but still have to look for it. And she had sharply produced with red on the paper and then hired them to do the illustration. So that photo I showed where there's a painted line that was forced on the inside. Those were all reforested by guys who formerly were user group. So those kind of projects at a higher scale work. But as you remove 10 or 20 or 25 or 30 guys in a truck of production of the trees, you still have an army of people behind them that are willing to go to the truck and do the advantage. It's funny because there is something that needs to be done by people. So I think the idea of protection has to be really integrated with the idea of alternative livelihoods. What can we do going forward to deal with the size issue? We haven't seen too many efforts by the Asian government on the right on the border, or in other areas of the markets we have a lease of protected area are pretty well, but pretty solid about protecting the pine forests. Some of them are they prioritize pine forests and some of them have forests as well. So in the Haiti there is so many issues to address as natural resources that fall by the wayside. So why don't we concentrate on the film because it's a really unique scenario where we have the legal product that you can follow and start to finish what's happening in the timeline. Because we like to be able to have access to the movie and have someone out there and does it and it's a legal drug and we can actually follow how it moves. It's really unique to have that access because it's not a drug that's relatively safe to do it. In, in a lot of cases with deforestation, there's people can stay in our loophole. We're concentrating much more on the side and that's much more where the charcoal is a much bigger issue. On the south side, there's a whole other set of issues, mostly where we have to use the loophole we have to build. There's big landowners who make it, who claim that title to their lands and have parties who are producing these products. Some of them hire grandkids and then they're not to do it. Each part, each place has its own risk area. And even in the Bay of Hull, where we were in mountain biking near a second of Lugo, we saw lots of people in the Bay of Hull. A friend of mine went with a helicopter and he was like, this is not that far. And one day they saw that there was a big tree fire and there was also a scattered group of fire. So when you have people in desperate situations and you're not in a protected area that's not really protected, 
to see opportunity to do something. And it's just got to be meaningful and it has to be a short term. Uh, you mentioned before that the government on the Amazon is going to be exported. Uh, was there any government uh, or uh, maybe uh, considered uh, export countries? Yeah, it, it, it's, hard to, it's hard to get any good information on this uh, from where we've been. We've heard to rumors out that we might find some exports in the first place. And we have a source now that knows that we're working hard on the company that we're able to post that is being exported. Um, but we don't have any firm applications. The way that we've shot at home has been way more money to go out to shoot and make more money to go out to shoot. So that's definitely been something we want to confirm and find out at some time. Um, and we've also heard information that other islands are going to be exporting. In my mind, it makes no sense because they have this sort of insatiable appetite for cardboard. You see exceeding amounts of cardboard in the news and thousands of sacks. So it seems more likely to make other things to be people in the place where you do things to do around the country. This is awesome. I go to other talks and people ask silly questions about this thing every day. It's been great. I'm excited to be there. Very interesting. Much is impacted in the deforestation. There's kind of, I think, uh, you know, at least in terms of production, there seems to be ebbs and flows. Um, you know, there's some areas we get the maybe six or eight months ago, it's not like an order year that we had in, it was when the president came into public. There was some general that was changed in some key area where the airport is now going to be all the time going to be in this purpose. You can't go to Haiti and even get products and things like that. So it's just when that general gets changed or some other scenario changes and impacts most of the stuff that we have. We've seen another area where they're clamping down on the high mountain forest because the government wants to lease the low mountains. And the main thing is no matter what the factor is, whether it's an earthquake or whether it's a drought or whether it's you know, uh, an election or a change in position or whatever purpose they have, as long as there isn't some other viable fuel source in the future six or eight months from now, it's going to get worse. Because they are bringing it around the boats, and they're willing to get. We saw some of these boats that were being built for like 100, 200 sacks of cardboard every year. That's not going to happen. If you're willing to cross a lake with that, if you're willing to take some risk, it's not going to happen. So as long as there's a continued uh, appetite for cardboard, we're going to have problems. And it's bigger than that. Do you think that if there's a border war, is there a to that? I think 10 years would be like a good block to see. I mean, I've been following this for 10 years and you see it's a lot of uncertainty out there. And, you know, it would be, if you can start to see positive trends happening along the way, I think, you know, a lot of that forest uh, it can be regenerated or certainly we're going to do it. Um, and there are other areas that are better conditioned that are still surrounded by salt and forest. Um, so I think, yeah, 10 years is a pretty short time frame for a forest like that, but I think you can really see change in that amount of time that there's some really concerning people that are taking a piece of the shot. Thank you. Well, I think it's the best example is the Nifty Republic, which started some time in the 1960s in Mexico, subsidized natural gas, made it a national policy. Um, and you know, I mean, some of you guys probably remember it, how your parents and your grandparents remember there were these concerted campaigns to get uh, cooking stoves out of the countryside. And they made it illegal to do charcoal, but they also made it to incinerate them and things like that. And then they made big investment in the import of natural gas and they got a lot of facility. If you pay attention now to drive around the world, which I don't have started doing this, there's stations all over the place where you can buy heat. And 
that has increased in the Phoenix area. It's much more scattered. But here, you know, if you drive in the remote road, you see people all of a sudden pulling out of gas and going to the gas station to get their tank. It's not, not to say this way, but that way. But at any rate, at least it's accessible to you. So that's kind of what I'm saying. Well, maybe you want to tell us I mean, I, I'm not an expert on you know, all aspects of Haiti, but you know, there are scenes around in different places. There, there is a, a ton of examples of Haiti. You know, there's a lot of great waste management there. There's you know, forests. There's a lot of serious pressure going on. So, 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 I, mean, I, mean, I can't really say categorically no, but I would say there's serious investment in Haiti by international groups and countries and UN and all this stuff. So surely there, there must be examples there. Um, this is the first time I've ever heard this interview, and I want to know why you chose it on this Um, Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, it's been surprising to us too. I mean, if anybody in the industry called to pay attention, there might be an article that's sort of like such and such group, uh, or it's a development group that you're working with. So many other issues to think about. You know, the health program is a lot of talk about wasting you know, garbage and you know, land building. So that occupies a lot of the you know, public dialogue. And then something like this is really good for us because it impacts the people and the people are important to this idea of this community there. And it's kind of what our objective is hopefully is to get this you know, awareness raised about this and then to hopefully get the construction going to be able to see how we really get it. Asian in the country, because it's not the case. You know, you see a lot of the traffic in the back of the boats are not used in Haiti for the production of this type of pollution. One last question, maybe, or is it good? No, no. Yeah, I mean, you know, they, they, you know, they, you know, they kind of cringe every time they hear it because they, you know, they, they become almost like you know, thieves, like you would say, like tourists like across the country. Um, I think there, there is still a tremendous work going on with people trying to really solve issues. I mean, there's a huge amount of international attention that's gone on to Haiti for so many years, so much has been affected. Um, I think that, you know, there's always some amount of hope that there's going to be a few percent environmental issues maybe. Elasticity, if you like, and see if the peak or you have some hope in optimism. So I sort of tend towards the optimistic side. So I think, you know, in Haiti, there are obviously huge challenges, big problems, um, but there's nothing that's insurmountable. In many of the cases, countries that have had major yeah, issues, yeah. especially environmental issues, are uh, relatively strong. Uh, they may be weak. You know, when I was a kid, they didn't really need to think about the environment that they had to uh, think of this place in the world. Now, we know people. Thank you guys very much.